Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a very special live stream. It seems that neighbors have moved into the YouTube channel for this morning. Hola, Mr. Dan. Hola, Marco. Nathan Goldman, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm here in the same box. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got a budget on this show. If you think everybody's <laughs> going to get their own box, you're out of your mind. What we're going to do today is we've done it over... Build the box. <laughs> Build the box. <laughs> Hey, we've got an emergency, and we need to get that third box. So we're going to go ahead and do whatever we can to get that third box. Uh, hey, Brandon Garrett, how are you, buddy? So here's what we're going to do today. Like insane people, we've been watching process videos over the radio. Today we thought, what if the audience could actually see the video that we're looking at? So we're going to look at a video, a process video the DKNG did. Everybody loves the process form porn from the DKNG studios. Uh, we're going to be looking at a Dave Matthews poster. What's the what's the background on this Dave Matthews band poster for Boston? Wait, before we jump into this, should we make sure everyone's private browsing? I feel like we're oh. some real shit here. Yeah, so here's what you want to do. You want to get out of where you're at right now, shift mm. Apple in. I don't know how I know this off the top of my head. I, I mean, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. the browser's darker for some reason. <laughs> oh, look at that little guy with the trench coat. Where did he come from? All right. <laughs> So now you do that, uh, put uh, a, a, a post-it note over your camera, not you two. <laughs> All of a sudden, Dan's just an orange square. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> is that good? There you go. <laughs> now you, This is a guy who's private browsed before. All right. So we're going to start the video, and we'll watch it. And uh, Brandon Garrett said he just fired up his VPN. So, I mean, obviously... He knows what's going on. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't want to be linked to your home uh, IP address <laughs> under any circumstances. I love I love when you go to a torrent website and it's like, private browsing is not enough for them to know what you're downloading. And I'm like, what? They're warning the sickos. They're warning the sickos that the shift Apple in is not going to stop the FBI from raiding your PC. Those guys always have PCs, by the way. Uh, you always see them, the, the FBI walking out with that like beige tower of just, you know, nastiness. All right, let's get started here with our video. Stand for again? Was it pedophile computer? What is that again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they should just arrest you when you're trying to buy it rather than <laughs> waiting for you to log in. <laughs> it gives a whole different meaning to the gateway store. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> All right, let's get started. So we have a Dave Matthews Band poster from Boston, Maryland. Um, how Massachusetts. Long Boston, Massachusetts, too. The other Boston. How right. long? The lesser known Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was Boston strong for? So you guys did this video. You guys have been working for Dave Matthews Band for what? About five, six years? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, maybe even longer than that. Because, yeah. It's been a while. Pretty early on. Yeah. How many posters have you done for them? Do you rem remember? Off the top, like would... 10, 20? Uh, definitely less than 20, more than 10. Okay, so, right. yeah. fifteen. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great a number that we came to. <laughs> let's just say fifteen. <laughs> okay, so let's jump in and look at the process video for the Boston, Maryland poster, the lesser known of the two twin cities. My camera's way too close to my face. <laughs> now nah, you look good, baby. You look good. All right, here we go. Dave Matthews Band. I've got the music turned down, so everybody will just have to hack up your dress and show your world to me. All right. So we always start out with the sketch. Uh, the pencil sketch that we see, that's what the client gets, right? Like you send that over to a client, say, here's our ideas. They say, we like the idea. And then, therefore, when you guys start rendering and building, you're doing it with a, a bit of confidence that the client's on board, correct? Yeah. And especially with gig posters that once they've signed off on an idea, usually there's no pushback after that. Right. So the, And I'll give you a little inside baseball on this one, that this was originally a poster for a different city. Yeah. Um, and we kind of did this whole lantern approach for a different location. And then they said, could you make it work for Boston? And we ended up swapping out that um, content to make it work for this city. Got it. Got it. Uh, somebody just wrote in the comment section, Jimmy Bryan writes, I just realized Nathan is better looking than Billy. Take it, Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's going to start a lot of shit. <laughs> <laughs> There's already a little bit of beef, Jimmy. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> I've only got so many people on the network. We don't need them to fight Battle of the Network stars. All right. I also have a lot of Snapchat filters that I'm using right now. So. 
<laughs> yeah, this is like way different. You don't see any like the pus or my eye patch or anything. Yeah, yeah those in real aren't life, even real glasses. <laughs> in real life, <laughs> real life, he doesn't have the birds flying around his head all the time. All right, <laughs> so far we've we've done really good. We're uh, five minutes in our stream and we've showed everybody four eclipses. Yep, and that's the whole poster. <laughs> and that's how they did it. So those eclipses that you laid out, those were setting the base, or is that going to come in later? Because those just disappeared. Yeah, that was a, uh, I'll just make this whole thing with circles. And then I um, said, no, fuck that. That's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So did I see you build half yeah. and flip? It's uh, half and um, revolve. revolve. Yeah. Half and revolve. Look at that. So now we're looking at some crazy 3D rendering. This is actually done inside of Illustrator? Yeah, yeah. And you can learn more about the 3D Revolve tool in our new Skillshare class, but more about that later. <laughs> Where to plug? Where link to below, plug. guys. Link below. <laughs> uh, Make sure to smash that like button. <laughs> we just got a request to bring up the levels on DK. DK, they're having a hard time hearing you out there in TV land. Oh, oh. Uh, how do I bring up my levels? Over on your Scarlet. Figure it out. All right, so... I want to cruise it a little bit more. So, Nathan, for a while, it was very blown out. There was just a blob, like a 3D shading blob. But then, all of a sudden, it went back into the form of the illustration. Like, how do you how do you go from blob mode to beast mode? <laughs> I'm going to let Dan test out his new settings to describe that. But it's all, all in those 3D tools and based on the perspective that you're using. Got it. Um, okay. This is going to get technical, but on the Scarlet, <laughs> is it the... Uh... <laughs> well, Dan, what do your levels look like in Audacity? Are they like peaking or are they small? Uh, they're tiny, which yeah. is not good. He's just yeah, a little so, feller. So see where your microphone is plugged in, the number one uh, volume dial there? Yeah. Turn that up. Okay. I'm turning it up. Oh, turning there we up. go. He is there, hot. There, 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 there he we goes. Go. There he goes. He's hot. Hey, guys, is this, is this loud enough? <laughs> that's, that's way too much. Okay. Okay, hold on. We are good to go. Uh, the, the, poor, the poor girl listening with AirPods in just hate, <laughs> hates DK. She's like, you know what? They should build that wall. All right, so. <laughs> okay, so, Dan, we had a blob of shading, and now it just went into the actual form of your illustration. How did you go from blob mode to beast mode? Uh, you're talking about the little uh, circle thing with the like the light on it. I'm talking about this. We were just at like this, right? Uh -huh. And and then all of a sudden you just clicked a button and it just kind of went. Yep. Yep. So we're, I mean, just like there, it's all spun out, and then the next thing yep. you know, I looked at it and we're we're back to our form. Is that you just working on the 3D rendering? Yeah. So basically, I'm playing around with the settings in um the revolve tool and um right there was kind of playing with perspective because i wanted okay. it to you notice on the top of the uh the lantern and the bottom of the lantern it's kind of moving in different directions yeah so the perspective would be like the center of the lantern and we're kind of getting like a warped point of view where we're seeing a bit of the the top of the bottom and the bottom of the top so to speak got it so our vanishing point would probably be somewhere on that vertical stem of the lantern so everything and, is just yep. going to make decisions sprawling out from there okay yep yeah so that's basically trying to match it to what our intentions were with the sketch as much as possible got it got it all right let's yeah. continue on so now i just rolled another five seconds and it's like real chunky gradients once again mm -hmm. this is that tool helping you finite get your settings in there yeah so you can like break down how many steps are going to be involved in terms of like lighting mm. so like that's like pretty chunky mm -hmm. um whereas you can go super smooth and it look like you know you're playing with clay um but this is kind of a good indication of figuring out where the light would be and how i would break it up but shortly after this i decided that i'm not going to really use too much of this program other than just like the main shape that was made Got it. So now we have a rectangle box over the right-hand side. Are you getting ready to clip some stuff here? So I found out that after doing this, it's not quite perfectly symmetrical. Mm. So I cut it in half again mm -hmm. after it's been rendered and then do the billy flip. The billy flip. Uh, Chris knows where the art writes in. I love my lamps chunky. 
<laughs> this is for you, Chris. <laughs> Don't worry. We've got the chunkiest lamps in the game. <laughs> All right, so the first color palette I see is a, a navy, a goldenrod, a, sort of a, a lighter blue, and a white. Is mm -hmm. is that a, I just need some different colors to differentiate things, or are you already thinking this is going to be what goes out to the printer? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to keep it down to like three colors, yeah, maybe four max. So one of those colors is going to represent paper. Uh, either this is going to be a flood of blue, or it's going to be on blue paper. So... This is kind of just a starting point to be like, okay, I like to work with something warm, something cool, something neutral, and then they'll change from there. But um, this is kind of a starting point, which ironically kind of ended up being the end point anyway. Okay, cool. I have I used to do a lot of illustration just in like red, white, black, and gray so I could easily see the different pieces and mm -hmm. then worry about finessing color schemes later. So I didn't know if, you know, because these colors seem sort of harsh and and basic now but i forget how much you're going to render them and just lay them on top of each other over one another and really sort of use like the best parts of each yeah so basically the way we usually start is pretty much primary got it usually there'll be like a red a yellow and a blue got it and, and if you think about how much half toning we might end up with something like this you're probably never going to see the pure color in any type of large um flood of ink it's going to be like taking that yellow and just stippling it to make the glow of a, a flame or something. So it's a little counterintuitive that sometimes you need to use super saturated colors because we know it's going to get knocked down by like 50% when it's right. just dots in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Enon Avatar writes in, so DK and G is just a happy Billy on steroids after he saw that you guys do the Billy flip as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this just in Southern lawyer got a letter from Billy's attorney looks like you guys might have a case on flipping half a poster around all right so the we're watching you start to just basically go through it and just pick different like vertical points you're, you're just kind of going through and picking your different like i guess the non-angular parts of the lamp yeah so after you do this whole revolve thing it does cut it up into the areas that you would see in that preview but i made it all one color so that i can like pick and choose what i'm going to be working with yeah um so i'm i'm uniting the the facades Got so it. like there's a there's a front facade like right, right there that needs to be united with its right side and i'm just turning into um one shape at that point when i went to art school in kentucky we call these fake aids moving on fake aids see a little bit all right so we just saw you sort of work the light in the base yep and that's that harsh yellow color but it's mm -hmm. now gradient out and doesn't look so harsh as nathan was just explaining why you go with the color that harsh and why we don't see it that way yeah i mean even with what you're looking at you're not going to see any solid yellow even in the center there it's just going to be like bigger dots at some point got it and then the lime green is just to sort of give you an indication of where you're working at yeah yeah it's that's when i'm like i can't see what i'm doing this will be able to to like differentiate what I'm looking at. And somewhere a Seahawks fan heart just broke. Oh, he's making a Seahawks lamp. No, just using your shitty color to see where he's at. <laughs> as much as I don't know about sports, <laughs> I think that's Seattle. Are we talking about Seattle? You got it. When you heard my mark on the uh, guess the name of the football team game that I played with you. Yeah, I was super helpful. <laughs> okay, so I am glad that we didn't just go with a Patriots color scheme for this poster because we could have easily done red, white, and blue for Boston and still got the blue in there, but I'm glad we didn't go that route. Mm -hmm. A little well, expected, I think it, it would. It I, would I, I think it'd be cool, though, because enough hasn't gone right for them. So, <laughs> yeah, they, they need a little something to boost their ego a little yeah, bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a dry spell there. All right, so now you've really, in a matter of time, you've really got this like the sort of the horizontal ledge, these steps going up of the basis lamp. You've really got these shining. And that's still, that's now just a mixture of the yellow and the white, Dan? Uh, yeah, so just kind of playing with the light source, knowing that um, this fictitious light's going to come from the top right-ish. Um, those facades that are like pointing more upward are mm -hmm. going to be brighter. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm kind of playing with right now. Got it. And um, those gradients are kind of like um, a starting point to use for anything that's circular on this thing. Got so it. I could like copy and paste. Well, actually more like eye drop that shit and, uh, and basically make the same body for each 
portion up until it gets to something more complicated. And this little dark band that we're putting in now on our far right, it, mm-hmm. that is to indicate... Uh, you're talking about the little light blue that's kind of cutting in there? Yeah, we, we we're breaking up our halo, and you're, yeah. you're creating this like vertical dark shadow that's going up. Will everything on the right side of that be dark as well? Are you sort of figuring out like your cutoff point? Yeah, I'm trying to like... With gradients, you can just do the simple thing, which is like dark to light. But when you're dealing with um, something that's rounded, you're kind of going to get like multiple highlights yeah. where it's like the the main highlight and then like the cool highlight that's kind of reflecting off of a surface nearby. Yeah. Um, so that's what's happening on the very, very edge where it kind of brightens up slightly, but it's not going back to yellow. Got it. Um, and what I'm doing with these highlights that are like, pointing upward is i'm trying to give them that shadow as well but not with the darkest color so it's just like with the lighter blue so everyone has a relationship with each other but they have different rules based off of where they're facing and by the way i know how to do all this stuff i'm just being that good guy that good friend on an infomercial that goes my friend said vacuum cleaners are expensive and loud and then the guy goes oh no not at all vacuum cleaner (laughs) <laughs> Good news, Mark. This vacuum cleaner sucks. <laughs> All right. So we move on. Working on the base, kind of repeating the same process that we talked about, putting the little rays that are all around it. Yeah. We're- and this is where it gets a little confusing because it's not a gradient anymore. I'm kind of like making my own shapes because they are they have to kind of taper into the top there. And at some point, don't you have to kind of just start creating and following your instinct because if every time you're moving something you're trying to think about it as a 3d render you're burning a lot of time making every step like this crucial piece of the process yeah i mean this is the biggest battle with me is like fighting technicality versus aesthetics yeah and does it look good and does it make sense then then mission accomplished but i'm kind of more like my instinct is it has to make sense like more, more than anything else. And that's what I love about your work because I was on this past weekend, I was over on Dribble looking for stuff for the live video I did yesterday where I looked at designers that had sort of rebranded the USA. And I found a lot of people that are dabbling with textures and trying to make things look real, but they don't tell the story the whole way. Like they, they kind of pick and choose when they put these sort of details and renders in. And I feel like if you're going to go down that road, you need to tell the story of realism unless the whole purpose of the piece is just to set a false narrative. But a lot of these people are trying to make things look real, but then they just miss crucial shadows or shadows without a highlight. And I like that you actually, everything that you do, it makes sense in the real world. Yeah. And it's probably only just to appease me and my OCD, but Never I, I think that, <laughs> I feel like most people would see stuff like this and they'd get the point. Like, oh, that's a shiny object. Right. And that's pretty much it. Moving on. Still working on the base. I mean, this just goes to show the dedicated of, dedication of work that you put this much just on the base, which most people are going to look at this and get caught up in the glass and what's inside of the actual lantern. Going up to the top, we just see more of the same, but we're seeing it from an upside down perspective. Mm-hmm. Just rendering and working it over. Same principles, just going and going and going, making sure that every plane is treated differently and keeps to your fictitious light source. Now we see you putting in the handle there, more of what we saw on the base, but just in this different sort of shape. Are shapes like this harder to do when it's like a tube that actually the light source changes as it goes from north to south? Or do you enjoy the cylinder type stacking process on the top and the bottom? Because the the top part, it looks like once you got the bottom figured out, that top part you just breeze through in about three and a half seconds. Yeah, well, yeah, obviously it was a lot of the same stuff. Um, I would say the harder part probably was the um, the bottom, okay, just because it had that like weird taper, yeah, shape. But all the other stuff is kind of like basic shapes that I mean, that literally start off with like a stroke and then breaking it up into different pieces from there. Um, and knowing that the light source is pretty bright in that area, it's yeah. not going to be like, there's not going to be a lot of ambiance p- beyond that point. So it's like, this is going to be a lantern. The light's coming very much from the center near those, um, those little pillars. Whereas, uh, you know, the bottom, it's kind of like a bit more than that. It's like the ambience of the light beyond that. Um, 
So it's kind of a guessing game at this point, but the point is just to try to make it look like the light is mostly coming from the center. Walk me through this real quick. Right now, where we're at at this, how many layers are in your Illustrator file? Like if all of a sudden you decided that the base feels weird now that you've got some of the vertical pieces, how hard is it for you to go back and to get into one of those gradients? So I don't really work in layers. I more work in groups and groups. clipping masks. Okay. So in terms of layers, um, there's really just two in the end. It's like the art and then the, the sketch underneath. Really? Everything is yeah. just together in clipping masks and groups? Yeah. Wow. So that whole bottom part has got a, a selection of clipping masks, like each shape that you see that's holding a gradient is a series of gradients within a clipping mask and then the whole thing itself is a group so you do a lot of double clicking on it going into that grayed out look that i accidentally always slip into just to be back to yep. the real world so you spend, a lot of, down. you spend a lot of time in the upside down uh yeah. jimmy bryant wrote in he said is this the first time that you use 3d process i know the answer to that is no but i wanted to ask you when did you guys start using this 3d process uh well um we got really into it with uh isometric stuff so all the the murals and the, the beer cans that we've done for almanac um i'm trying to remember if there's stuff that we've done prior to that we're using the 3d stuff i mean i feel like very early on we would use like 3d extrude and bevel and rotate all these things but just not to this level that you Sometimes those tools can be really helpful to create a shape that you want without giving it this 3D rendered look. Yeah. So I feel like sometimes you might see work that is actually using these tools, but it's kind of flying under the radar. Whereas when you're doing something that is actually a cylinder with a light source like this, it's really easy to see it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's been those tools have been in Illustrator for many years now. So I think we've kind of used them since the beginning, but perhaps as our style evolved in the last few years to be a little bit more of that dk and g hd kind of look maybe it started being more obvious that it was there got it got it and by the way uh over on skillshare today you can go take the new dk and g class that just dropped yesterday which is where they show you how to do the isometric drawing so even if you don't want to do the isometric illustrations it would give you the ability to learn those tools to then mm -hmm. as we're seeing you know they're not huge fans of always doing that style but some of the things they learn through that process is being implemented in various other designs so always good to know how all the tools work in your illustrator bar all right let's keep cruising all right so you're just going through and you're rendering that is a handle right because the glass will live inside of that um now you're putting in your rivets and your bolts mm-hmm it's kind of the side structure, I guess. I guess you could hold it, but there is going to be an additional oh, top handle the top as well. top handle, right, right. So yeah. I guess it's kind of a thing so that the glass doesn't easily break if you fall it over and then create a barn barn fire like they always had on Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. yeah. They burn a We're lot actually of in talks down. with Southern Lawyer about it. We can't talk about barn fires, actually. He said not to no, no, talk about it. Let's, let's not go there. All right, so now we have some speckled tone texture. Uh, mm -hmm. an image of some sort of like stone or, or countertop s surface. And Dan, you're going to take this and implement it in where? Just over the whole thing? Yeah, so this is another clipping mask. I, I know at this point that I'm, this metal area is not going to really change too much. Mm -hmm. So I'm now starting to add in texture. So I, everything I've made, I basically cut it up into one piece and made it one shape and um, threw in a texture as like representing the blue, which is actually kind of more representing holes and everything because it's going to be on blue paper. Right. And that texture that we saw, it's just laying flat over everything. But because you fooled us into creating all the shadows and the indentations and the vertical pieces and the horizontal pieces and the curves, mm -hmm. it's making our eyes feel as if all of that metal has sort of a, <clears throat> excuse me, has sort of a been sitting out in the woods too long rusted vibe to it. Yeah. Yeah, so you can make something 3D just with like gradients and color, but the second you throw over a flat texture, it already has that three-dimensional look anyway. Got so it, it kind of makes the look of, of like your wrapping texture on top of it, but technically it's just a flat texture. Because if you had to go back through each and every piece and render texture over it in the curvatures, yeah. it wouldn't be worth doing it. No, I mean, everything that 
we do is about time efficiency and how can we make it look like what we want as quickly as possible. So this is one of those techniques. I always, and you can you can do that in those three D tools. You can add a uh, you can map an image onto each thing that's three D rendered. But yeah, I mean in this case because. It's kind of like if you take the time to do your 3D rendering nicely, then you can get away with stuff like dropping the texture on and find those efficiencies. Whereas perhaps if this wasn't as 3D looking from the beginning, the texture is not going to fix it. So it's right, kind right. of one of those lessons of like, make sure it looks good in its bare form before you start adding on top of it because you can't necessarily fix it with like additional layers and things. I, yeah. think, I think about Dan's love of efficiency and it was... The day before Thanksgiving, I was at his mom and dad's house in San Diego, and I was showing him how I upload the episodes every day for AID, and he was, I was like, I go here, I make this file, I make this file, I do this, and he just goes, this is wildly inefficient. This is way <laughs> too many steps. This is way too many steps. And every night when I'm sitting here doing it, I just hear you, like a little blue hologram, Obi-Wan Kenobi going, it's too many steps. <laughs> Yeah, that's that kind of stuff bothers me a lot, and it's probably a problem of mine. All right, so we saw that you did put in a a second additional texture in the shadow, so that obviously that's a different surface, that's a different texture, correct? Yeah, because if you put like a flat texture on a surface that's like horizontally moving away from you mm -hmm. at a very steep angle, mm -hmm. it starts to look too flat. So um, this was a different kind of texture to make it look like ground more rather than like metal. And to lead your eye into the subject matter. Exactly. Got it. Okay. We're cruising, putting that little handle on there, building up this sort of that nice bell-shaped handle handle where you would carry it. Mm -hmm. Working it over. All right. Now we're getting into glass land. A lot of people Finally. showed up for the glass. <laughs> All right. So on the glass, a couple of obvious things I see. The first thing you do is you put your gradient sort of over the football shape to to create sort of that we're looking through a glass lens. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that you're putting attention to is the actual thickness, the, the grade thickness of the glass on the left and right. So those two little yeah. techniques are going to make us realize that there is a clear bubble around whatever goes inside. Yeah, yeah. It's like when you look at a Coke bottle and you realize how thick that glass is and how much liquid wasn't really there. Right. <laughs> it's Actually, like, I have uh, a question for you on that, Dan. Like when you're making that thick look of the glass there, is that something that you just saw in your mind's eye and you were like, I know this is what the glass bulb is going to look like. I'm doing it. Or were you looking at reference or was there some trial and error being like, it doesn't look like glass. It needs more thickness in these areas. Or like, what was your mindset going into that? So, you know, when we hang out and you may notice I'm just kind of like staring off into the distance and like not involved with anyone. Always. Yeah. And I'm like, Dan, I'm trying to tell you, I need you to take me to the hospital right now. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. let me look at this Coke bottle. I'm usually staring at the bevel of glass, like understanding how that light works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, um, I'm, it's just something I remember seeing. And, uh, like when I'm not on the computer, I'm kind of like looking at real life IRL shit and like, oh, that's how it really looks. <laughs> and, and then that kind of like gets applied into this, but I'm not like s sitting in front of reference um, at that point. I'm more just kind of remembering what I what I saw in the past. Live chat wise guys, Jimmy Bryant goes in regards to Nathan's question. Ask a guy who's looking through glass. Shots fired on <laughs> NG wearing glasses. All right, hmm. let's keep cruising. So now we see you put the ray in. So that ray is actually placed behind the lantern. Yeah. To to create a sense of depth and that there's light coming out. Does that ray touch up to the edge? Is there any sort of like hard halo around things? Uh no, it's just sitting behind it. Okay. So as you can see, like obviously I'm not making this glass clear right yeah. now. Because I'm gonna throw stuff in there and I want to prioritize that before I start dealing with light beyond that. Got it. But I know that whatever's going to be in there, it's going to be making some sort of ambient light. So might as well see what that looks like and um, get it placed now. And it might change. I think it does. But um, it's just a way of kind of like putting in things I know will be there in the, in, in the future. Just might as well get it done. All right. Now the live chat is making cataract jokes 
And I, I think it's real cool that you guys make fun of the handicap, okay? It's real cool that you make fun of my handicap and you make fun of my cataract. And yes, my lamp would have broken glass around it. <laughs> the doctor said, life to you looks like you're looking through a broken windshield. <laughs> Oh, it's amazing to be poor in America. God bless healthcare that none of us have. All right. Emergency. I don't know if this is the time for it, but I would like an update on the cataract. What, kid? Where you, yeah. Where, when are you going to get surgery? What's the plan? Are you going for the, the, the short lens or the long lens? <laughs> it's a whole, yeah. We'll know more after I go see a doctor on February 28th. Uh, I will say this. That the emergency in this country is definitely our southern border and not our health care. All right, so now we're putting a a cylinder. We're building the lighthouse inside of the lamp. Uh, curious to me that this part's done last. So is it basically you want to know that the lamp idea works and you want to exactly know how much real estate you have to build this illustration? Because it seems to me a bold move of... You got this whole lamp, but the selling point is what's inside of it. And then mm -hmm. you do that last with a limited amount of real estate. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could just come up with a general rule of how I usually do this. <laughs> they just but... wrote, build the wall in Mark's eye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I do think you should maybe get the surgery done in Mexico before the wall is built. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you might get a a good deal. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, or die. Yeah, I mean, it's just your eye. You have another one. I mean, I carry a spare. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to play psychologist here on why things happen in the order that they do, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but I feel like you probably do the parts of the project first that you feel most comfortable with. And like <laughs> stacking the metal cylinders is like, I can imagine how this would look. And once I get in a rhythm of it, it's going to go easily. Whereas creating a world inside of a glass uh, dome is a little bit more out there and like could require more finessing and trial and error. So you're like, let me get the structure in place that I feel comfortable with. And then I'll approach the unknown last. Uh Yes, which is going to sound like I'm a hypocrite because I remember giving Mark instructions to do the <laughs> Just make opposite. Make the hardest part first, dude. <laughs> and it's all easy from there, man. Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on your mood. Like, if you're not motivated to do something, start with the easy thing, and then you'll kind of get like warmed up and ready to do the hard thing. But um, if it, it depends, I mean, I've done the the other way around where I'm like, this is. I gotta, this is a big project. If I get the hard part done, then the rest is not going to stress me out. I, I think, too, another part of this is one of your theories is that once this lamp is built and rendered, it already looks real. So mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a room to not go super hard what's on the inside, because if you brought people this far, they'll believe it all. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, definitely. Because another part of it is like, what if I put a lot of effort and time into this? Uh, scene and then I'm like well now I gotta make the lantern look just as good and detailed right it kind of um sets the the style of everything by yeah with the simple it's thing. a good point of like what do you want to set as your standard and have everything else follow those rules as right. opposed to backing yourself into a corner where you didn't want that much detail or style or whatever got it let's cruise yeah. on and, and look at the little world get built uh chris noseworthy wrote in and goes how long did this take irl it's a four minute video <laughs> yeah no this is all real time i don't know <laughs> i don't know I why like, people what? don't want to pay me thousands of dollars to do this it takes me five minutes <laughs> goddamn efficient that's what i said <laughs> all right so that burst inside of the glass yeah. that's the magic trick really because that light source is contained inside that glass and really, now that we've I got it paused and zoomed up, looking at sort of the natural gradients that's happening on the curvature of the thickness of the glass pane, mm -hmm. that that's really some great subtle storytelling. Thanks. <laughs> All right, putting in the doors, looking at it from a distance, you really get an idea of what's going on. We're putting in the land, the water, just really repeating a lot of the things we've already done. How do you put those random dots in there for your stars? It, you just actually drop them random or do you have a way to create random? Because everybody knows random is one of the hardest things to make. Um, usually start off with uh, one, sorry, 
two to three sized dots yep. and kind of like randomly throw them in there because I don't want to have the same dots. Otherwise, they'll look too graphic. Um, and then I will take that group, uh, copy and paste it, rotate it, and then take that grouping of six, copy and paste it, rotate it. Twelve. And not, yep. And then exponentially just kind of grows, but I'm not really worried about their placement until... I filled the space and then that's when I kind of like move around stars. Got it. Got it. That way everything is kind of random based off the fact that I'm just rotating things arbitrarily. Mm. And then, um, then you're kind of like, Oh, those two stars look weird together. And you kind of like delete or move at that point. All right, let's keep cruising. So I see you actually took textures of water. You took textures of stars. So you're putting real world in to mix it up with the vector art to help sell it. Yep. Uh, uh, you're taking an image of bricks to put over the actual lighthouse. You're taking rocks to actually put over the rocks. So it's just the combination of taking that real world grit, put it over the um, vector shapes mm -hmm. that just takes that storytelling another level with also all the gradients and light source pieces that we have in there. It's the three it's, three effect. Yeah, it's the same theory with like using a flat texture over something that's been highly rendered with gradients. like. The more work you put into something before texture, the more you're going to trick the viewer into thinking that those textures were custom made. I really enjoy this type where it's Dave Little, Band Little, Matthews Big in the center, and then putting those vertical or uh, horizontal bars up above it. I, I like that a lot. Hope it makes the cut. Oh, it does. It makes the cut. It's in there. <laughs> well, it's still, still in progress. No! But yeah, that's been something... <laughs> that's been tricky to get away with with this band is that even though the band is called Dave Matthews band, they almost shy away from it. Like we're a little embarrassed that we ended up with our lead singer's name. It's really like everyone's in the band. So in the past, if we've tried to do like the name Dave Matthews, huge and the word band small, they're like, no, it's too much emphasis on Dave. Um, so this was actually, a, <laughs> this was actually a case where they let us get away with some hierarchy in the type there, and they don't they don't always do that. That's cool. Interesting to know. I'll, I'll take that in consideration when I work for DMB next time. And it's also tricky sometimes. I was just going to say, like, with this style, sometimes my instinct is to match the style of the type as much with the artwork as possible. And right. it's like, well, if the, the object is super 3D, then the type needs to be that way too. But sometimes that just feels like too much of the same thing and they're competing so sometimes the flatter type can actually contrast nicely with the 3d object i do like though that you put a, a bend and you know because if it i always hate the illustrators that work forever on an illustration and then they just literally times new roman type out green day over the top of it I, you know there, <laughs> yeah. there is a level of the the typography actually has a rhythm with what's around it but i do understand that if Everything had halos and, and a depth. And, you know, it's like the reason why Rush sucks is everything's a solo. You know, yeah. it's like everybody can't always be playing a solo at the same time. Rush, Primus. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky to like have the balance of you want it to look intentional and like you spent time on it and right. want it to fit organically, right. but not so much so that it just like everything's fighting for attention. Okay, so now we're looking at those last. Earlier in the thread, and we'll just keep this short. Maybe it's a different topic for a different time mm. but Enon asked taking gradients and color separating those mm -hmm. that's what you that's converting it over to a halftone right head on over to skillshare to learn more, more about converting <laughs> gradients into halftones yeah you uh, know try to not get something here we have free. time for right now <laughs> uh yeah yeah it's it's a uh, this is where people ask a lot of questions because it's like Oh, it's all dots all of a sudden, but it's um there's a whole Photoshop step in the separation process that we do to, to render it all, render it all, and um, it's not too complicated. It's just once you have everything um, layered out, you uh you rip it basically through a halftone filter. Awesome. And I guess another good way to think about gradients that we often use is the gradient isn't just going from one color to another; it's going from a full opacity of a color down to zero. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, let's say, like a yellow and a blue overlapping in the middle, your yellow separation would essentially go from yellow to a transparent gradient in the middle, and then the blue would do the opposite, blue to transparent. Yeah. So when those two separations hit each other, you get the transition, but 
essentially you can kind of work backwards in your separations, taking everything that's not that color and making it transparent. That's like mm -hmm. a super simplified way to try to describe it that might not totally make sense, but it's kind of this process of elimination of just removing the color that you don't need from that separation layer. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and he asks, so you actually create separate gradients for each color, which, yeah, you have, yeah. E each color has to be on its own journey so that you can convert it and then that, that yeah. before they all print out. The, actually, where you have it right now is a good thing to bring up because yeah this is only three colors oh got to move my car for sweet street sweeping just kidding um <laughs> so he pays for that shit no problem yeah i got a guy um so there's uh <laughs> it's he actually has him park it in on the illegal side just so he has more room for his car i'm i'm so loaded that i just get the ticket and i'm like whatever <laughs> <laughs> um so the the process of how this is layered is um, navy paper, then the light blue, then the yellow, then the white. And that's typically how we would do things that's on darker paper. And right. it's the opposite for lighter paper. Um, because you're going to get the brighter colors, the more layered they are on top of other colors. So um, what we're seeing there is like on that gradient of that cylinder, um, the darkest areas are representing just holes poking through. And uh, then we have blue, and there's actually blue basically behind all elements of yellow, if that makes sense. It's like holding it so that it gets as bright as possible. Right, so that it, there's something for it to grip onto when it goes down. Yeah, so it's not like yellow's hitting onto paper itself. It's actually hitting onto, more likely, another blue gradient. So it's kind of like gradient on gradient. Right. And that's how I build it. So it's like multiple layers of gradients rather than yeah, one gradient that needs to be broken up. If you're just to print yellow on a dark paper like this, it you wouldn't really get much of anything. Yeah, it would actually turn into like a, a greenish poopy mess. Yeah. Um so uh and then white obviously being the last, it technically anything that has white actually has like more likely blue and yellow underneath that. So right. like it's super bright. Right. Uh I do love that you guys decided to put the type behind the handle. I, I'm always a sucker for that type of layering because technically it doesn't make sense. The text would be there. So always working on that relationship between yeah. the copy and the, the, the final illustration always just makes things feel smarter. We call that um magazine style. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? You know it's Rolling Stone. All you got to do is see the R, and if Slash's top hat's in the way, you know where you're at, baby. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, how much do you want to cover up? <laughs> And there we go. There's the final pan and scan. We see the December 7th. Oh, it's the day before my birthday. Look, it's the day before my birthday. It's when John Lennon was murdered. We should buy this. <laughs> All right. Uh, so then we, we see the te text going around the cylinder there. And uh, everything has a place. Everything fits in nicely in this bad boy. Yeah, it's nice to keep things compartmentalized compartmentalized there it is compartmentalized. we did it we broke it down remember that you can go over to skillshare.com slash adventure or adventures one of those two is my code and you'll get a couple of free months and when you're over there if you're already a subscriber or a new um subscriber to skillshare make sure you take the new isometric course from dkng even if you don't want to learn that illustration style uh, as I as I said, they're still taking a lot of the things that they learned on that adventure and incorporating it into other art. So if you're looking to make your renderings a little bit more 3D, a little bit more realistic, what a great place to go. And it's a tremendous value when you become a member over at Skillshare. For those of you that hung out with us live over on YouTube, thank you so much for, for having fun with us. Uh, making comparisons between these guys and the Cobra, trying to get an AID feud going. And thanks a lot for making fun of me for being handicapped. I really appreciate that. I'd like to point out in over 910 episodes, I've never made fun of anyone. So, oh, yeah, for sure. No one it's at true. all. Yeah. It's true. All, yeah. It's all cupcakes and rainbows every episode. Yeah, so this is really a shame on my little monsters turning against me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just got another cease and desist in the mail. Sorry, <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. All right. What do you say we hop up over YouTube and hop behind that sweet paid wall of the circle of trust? Yep. And now that 
the uh, process porn's done, you want to go to your top bar, go to history, clear browser <laughs> history. VPN and you should be good. Off. And, and you know what? <laughs> just to be safe, let's just go over and click some CNN news articles. Mm-hmm. Makes it look like you were doing something. And just to confirm, the paid wall, is it more of a fence or is it a wall? <laughs> it's slats. It's digital slats. With okay. That, that podcast. Yeah. But it doesn't go, is it going to go across the whole internet or just part of it? It's going to go across the whole internet. All right. So we're going to. Finish that fence. <laughs> we are now going to go off of YouTube, but if you want to give us more tokens, we can go private. Okay. 